That's a little loud. <laughs> First Kings chapter 18. We're going to look at the 46 verses in that chapter. We'll start out with a, uh, for the first 16 verses, and then we'll progress through the 46 verses in the time that we have allocated for us this evening. Let me remind you as we're looking at these verses, as we look at this text, it's a wonderful study of how God used a man that was willing to be obedient to what God said. You remember he is God's weatherman. Don't know if you know that or not. But he made the announcement in uh, chapter 17, verses 1 and following, uh, that it's not going to tell the king, King Ahab, that it's not going to rain until I say so. And by the way, I'm going on a vacation. It was gone three and a half years before he announced that rain is coming. And keep in mind, as you look at the Old Testament, rain was an indication of the blessings of God. And because of Ahab and Jezebel and their wickedness and how they had led the nation into uh, Baal worship, as a result of that, uh, there's no rain. That is, there's no blessing from God for the nation. The direction that a leader of a nation takes is indicative of the direction for the entire nation and the blessings or the cursings of God on that nation. And that's exactly what we see in this text. We see in the text obedience and blessing. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. As I read audibly, follow with me your scripture uh, silently. We'll read the first 16 verses of uh, 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, this is not the writer of the book of Obadiah, uh, called Obadiah, which was, the, uh, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He was a secret follower of the Lord. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all of the fountains of water, and unto the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass for to, to grass to save the horses and the mules alive, but we lose not that we lose not the beast. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and he fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go and tell thy Lord, uh, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant unto the, into the hand of uh, Ahab to slay me? And the Lord, uh, as the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom where the my Lord hath not uh, sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and the nation that they uh, found thee not. And now thou, thou sayest, Go, tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And, and it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thence, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But thy servant, but I thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. In other words, he's been a follower of the Lord since he was young. Was it not told? My Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets, fifty in the cave, and fed them with bread and water. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Thank you so much, and you may be seated. <clears throat> the background of this is the prophet Elijah being obedient to the Lord and what he says to do. He had given the weather report to Ahab, and uh, then he was gone. In fact, during that time that he was gone, according to the scripture in chapter 17 of uh, 1 Kings, uh, according to that text, God hid him, God fed him, God protected him, God uh, rested him, and God provided uh, his protection uh, and empowered him to be used of him in the future. 
And I believe that a good footnote to that statement is that if we surrender to the Lord, he's going to protect us and provide us, empower us with what he wants us to do in carrying out the task that he's called us to do. And you find his obedience to the Lord in the 18th chapter. And as a result of that, the 38th verse, you find, then the fire fell which is indicative of the power of God, and uh, in that uh, a power of God, it was showing that as a result of the obedience of uh, Elijah, the presence of God and the power of God was felt and seen uh, because of his obedience to what God had said to do. If we're going to uh, experience the blessings of God through the empowerment of God in our lives, I believe there are three things in this text that we can elicit from the 46 verses and apply them in our lives even at this very hour. Three things. First of all, as we find those three things that are necessary, first of all, the commitment to serve actively. The commitment to serve actively. Secondly, the courage to stand alone. And third, the confidence to surrender absolutely. It takes those three things in your life and in my life if we're going to expect the blessings of God to fall on us and on our nation. Notice in the first two verses there, the command recorded. Go show thyself unto Ahab. Now, Elijah's enemy uh, was the king Ahab and Jezebel, the king and the queen. Uh, they hated uh, uh, Elijah because of his being a prophet of God. They had nothing to do with him, did not want anything to do with him. The king that hates God and God's man is the focus that you find in the text of what he's wanting to do against Ahab, uh, against uh, Elijah. Notice in the text, God had Elijah in the Bible training, as I called it in chapter 17. In the Bible training, it was the three years, three and a half years actually. In fact, it says a long period of time. Some use the term three years, but we'll show you in the scripture in a moment that it's actually three years and six months. It was three and a half years total, not just three years, that it did not rain. Too often, may I say to us, too often uh, we want to do a task, carry out a task before we're prepared to do the task. Too often in our lives as Christians, as individuals, we want to carry out the task, believing that God wants us to do it, but not prepared. You'd be surprised how many times I've seen those down through the years that will uh, enroll in Bible college. They'll get about halfway through. When it comes to midterm exams, they decide God didn't call them to preach or God didn't call them to study, one or the other, because they find that it's difficult. Uh, one young lad a number of years ago said when uh, God wants a better preacher, he's going to have to uh, produce better uh, preaching books because he did all of his preaching from some books that somebody had written about outlines and uh, words to say, and he'd just stand and regurgitate them on Sunday morning, Sunday evening in his church. The mindset that I don't have to study and prepare. God had prepared Elijah for this task. God had prepared him for what he wanted him to do and to avoid hardships and problems and hurts and difficulties in our lives. I believe that it's indicative on us and for us to find God's place for us and be found in the preparation. God knows how to prepare us in developing patience and developing that preparation. And God's timing is always right. But I want us to understand here with Elijah, and there are many people say, well, you know, he was a supernatural man. He was a superhero, if you will. Well, in James chapter 5, verse 17, says in part, Elijah was a man subject to like passions, that is, feelings, desires, and hurts, as we are. Elijah was a human being just as we are, nothing that was superhuman about him at all. He just simply was obedient to the Lord. And God says here, go. Literally, he is saying to Elijah, risk your life before the king because the king is searching for you. But I want you, he says to Elijah, I want you to go show yourself to the king. I want you to get out of the hiding. I want, your, your time of respite is over. Your time of preparation is over. Your time of rest and understanding of what I'd have you to do is done. Remember Paul and Silas, the scripture says, hazarded their lives for the gospel's sake. Here in that second, cha- second verse of this chapter, we find, and Elijah went. That is total obedience. God said it. That settles it. He says, okay, Lord, I'll do it, is basically what we find here. He chose obedience. Obedience. We have choices each and every day to make in our lives. But Elijah chose to be obedient. He could have said, Lord, don't you know that if uh, if Ahab sees me, if Ahab and Je- Jezebel finds me, that they will kill me. Lord, don't you understand that? God said, go. There was no argument. There was no discussion. There was no ifs and ands and buts. He simply made the choice to please the Lord. It was Joshua that said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Here, God is saying to Elijah, go. 
And Elijah is simply willing to be obedient. Notice not only the command recorded, but notice in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, the circumstances reveal. Notice the circumstances reveal. There is famine in the land. It says in Samaria, and as you study the scripture and the follow-up on that, you find that in Samaria, it was probably the uh, worst condition of the balance of the land in relationship to the famine that was taking place. In fact, in chapter 17, verse 1 says, There shall be no dew or rain these years, but according to my word. Uh, it was, uh, it's interesting when you look at Elijah and how God had chosen to use him. And he sent his uh, governor, uh, Obadiah, the scripture says, out to search for water. He and Ahab went out also to search for water. Both of them, as he is the governor, and here is uh, Ahab that's the king. Uh, Ahab says, I tell you what, uh, Obadiah, you go this way, I go this way. We're going to try and fi try to find some water so that the animals, the mules and the horses and the donkeys, etc., they won't starve to death uh, because we're not having water. I want you to let's start searching for the water so that we can preserve the people. Remember, when you look at chapter 16, uh, 1 Kings, the 33rd verse, it's the last verse in the 16th chapter, it says that Ahab was the most wicked king that had ever lived. He did more to displease God than all of the other kings of the nation in that day. We find that this is what is taking place. Is this happening today? May I say that I believe that we find the hand of God in some realm of judgment against our nation today as a result of what is taking place. We're now facing what could be a major, major financial crisis don't know if you read the article, don't even know if it was on the Communist Network News, but the CEO of J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan slash Chase, made the announcement, his last name is Diamond, I think it is, don't know his first name, pardon? Jamie Dimon said that we're going to have a recession and it's going to be deep, deep and very, very dangerous in the very near future. His words, not mine. It's the first time anyone in that position of financial know-how has said anything that harsh and that direct publicly that I know of in my lifetime. He made a very dire warning of what is going to take place. I believe that God is going to get America's attention, and I believe that attention is going to be through the famine of food and the famine in the realm of the needs that we have being met as a result of our disobedience to God and not willing to be what God says that we need to be as a nation and showing others around the globe what a godly nation is like and what it should be like. It is making the choice, making the choice. We find... The crisis that's before us, I believe, is God-ordained. I believe that God's on the throne and carrying out the work. Many people during the course of the past several months in particular have asked, well, how should I prepare? What should I do? My only answer is a lot of things we can do financially, a lot of things we can do for food, et cetera, et cetera. But the major thing is we need to turn back to God. We need to determine that we're going to serve God, obey God, and do what God's called us to do to be salt and light in a decaying, darkened society in which we're living in. Here is Elijah. God says, get up and go. Show yourself to uh, Ahab. And Ahab says to uh, uh, Obadiah, let's go out and let's search for water. Now listen, he didn't say let's search for, a uh, for Elijah. He's searching for water. He's interested in that which preserves life physically, but nothing in relationship to the spiritual need in the nation. There's the concern found in verses 7 through 14, the concern that is reviewed. When Elijah sees Obadiah, fascinating when you look at this text. Every time I study the text, I laugh a little at, at the, what is taking place here. Notice in the seventh verse in falling, and I'll not reread it, a couple of verses. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, look intently and see. Behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him. Obadiah knew Elijah. He knew who he was. He recognized him. And he said, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? He says, I think I recognize you. Aren't you Elijah? Aren't you the man? And he goes on to say, and he answered him and said, I am. Go, t go tell thy Lord. Go tell Ab Ahab. Go tell Ahab. My Lord, he's calling. Thy Lord, he's calling him. Behold, Elijah is here. I'm fascinated by that. As they're going out searching for water, as he's, uh, 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 Obadiah is doing exactly what the king has said. He's looking here and the king's looking over here. And he sees Elijah and he said, aren't thou Elijah? Uh, uh, Obadiah said here, are you trying to get me killed? Because in that 10th verse, notice what he says. 
as the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom where the my Lord hath not sent to seek thee, seek thee, or to try to find you, if you please. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. Each one that is said, we can't find him, we can't find him. The king had them to sign a, uh, an affidavit that, yes, I've been searching and no, I've not found him. And so here's Obadiah. Obadiah says, listen, Elijah, as sure as I tell, I tell the king that I found you, that I've seen you, as surely as I do that, you're going to disappear. You're going to leave. And then my neck's in the noose for telling the king that I found you. And I'll not be able to tell him where you are or point, him, point you out to him. Notice, he said, every nation... Everybody is searching for you. I find it fascinating. Here's the prophet preacher that all of the nation is now looking for a prophet preacher. All the nation is searching for the one that can make rain happen, if you please. All the ones are searching for Elijah that is the one that's despised because of what he's been preaching, what he's been teaching, what he's been saying, what he's been doing, and especially because of his weather report. Everyone's searching for him because they are in dire circumstances. I just made a little margin note. How about that? Heathen world searching for a preacher. The heathen world that said no to anything that's called spirituality. Now looking for the man of God. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to find a day if the rapture tarries, I believe we'll come to the point and place in American society and around the globe when there will be those that will be looking for a word from God. A word from God. What does God's word say? What is the hope? Where is the hope? What should we do? How should we turn? Where should we go? And we find the indication of that right here in this text. When God sends tragedy, war, famine, difficulties, or death, the world looks for a preacher and looks for an answer. Where do we turn? What do we do? How should we respond? And that's what we see in this text. Obadiah reminds Elijah that he is a believer also. He tells him what he had done in hiding the prophets in the cave to prevent uh, Jezebel from slaying them, from taking their lives. Notice. Not only do we see the command recorded and the circumstances revealed, notice in verse 15 and 16, the commitment recited. The commitment recited. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. He is assuring Obadiah that he's not going to disappear on him. Notice in that 16th verse, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Deal's done. The word's out. Uh, Obadiah says to Ahab, I found Elijah. I know where he is. I know where he is to be found. Notice in that commitment there. Elijah makes a commitment. Verse 15, I will surely show myself unto him today. Elijah saying, I'm not afraid of Ahab. I'm not afraid of what he'll do or say. I'm not afraid. I have been obedient to the Lord God and I know that God is going to protect me, provide for me. And I'm not fearful of what man can do in my life. I believe there comes a place and time in the life of every child of God that we need to make the determination, make the choice. I'm going to obey the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid of what Barack Hussein Obama, which is pulling the strings with sleepy Joe Biden in the Oval Office, which is an illicit, illegal president in office. I'm not afraid of what they're going to. I'm not afraid of the uh, disinformation board that they've set up called the Truth uh, uh, Ministry. I'm not afraid of what's going to be done if I stand before the school board and challenge them. I'm not afraid of what government can say or do in relationship to my life. I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ. I believe that's what every child of God, every Christian, every conservative needs to do today is to take that stand saying, I am not going to live in fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. And yet we live today in a nation where people are frightened to death of what government and what uh, agencies can do rather than trusting God being obedient. Here is Elijah. He is obedient to what the king says. He's obedient to what God says. And he is obedient to saying that I'm willing to meet the king regardless of what the king might do in my life. I want us to realize that is the commitment that Elijah is making. And I believe we need to be willing to trust the Lord. I believe we need to be willing to faith God. I, need, I think we need to be willing to follow and obey God. Elijah is committed to serve the Lord actively, even at the risk of his life. Actively serving, obedient, even at the risk of dying at the hands of Ahab. Notice in verses 17 and following. 
Let me read that for us. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, notice now, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou hast thy father's house, thine thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, that is the female goddesses, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table, and Ahab sent unto all of the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, Listen to the challenge that Elijah makes to the people. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, and put fire, no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under under. Verse 24, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the Lord God answered by fire, then the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under and they took the bullocks which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning until evening. That's about three hours, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass that at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Notice 28 and 29. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed. Now this has uh, been from noontime till now about three o'clock. And, uh, the and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Notice what the scripture is saying here. Not only there must be a commitment to serve actively, there must be the courage to stand alone. The courage to stand alone. Here is Elijah that he is willing to put himself in a position that he's going to stand against 450 Baal priests and 400 Baal priestesses. That is 850 Baal gods with a little g. He's going to stand and do battle and he's going to do battle alone because he knows that God is on his side. And I want us to understand whether we recognize or not, if it is me and God, that's a majority. Any place, any time, any counting that you might want, any, even with new math, that's still the truth of it. That me and God's a majority and we need to take a stand in knowing that God's going to protect us. Notice the complaint registered in verse 17 and 18. I like these two verses because it's so evident of what is taking place even in society today. Ahab blames the problem of the nation on the preacher. Ahab says it's the preacher's fault. It's the preacher's problem. Do you realize today the major, major, major problem that's taking place from the beltway of D.C. on down to the state houses, including the local city hall, the marble castle, as I call it. The mindset is that the problem in society is on the back and the shoulders of every Christian, every child of God, everyone that names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a mindset that pervades America today that says it's our problem. It's our fault. If you don't believe that. You just read the 32-page report that was given from the DOJ by Merrick Garland. God help us if he had been appointed, uh, been approved Supreme Court Justice. But the directive that was given to the FBI, if you voted for Donald Trump, if you're a registered Republican, if you're a Christian, then you're probably a domestic terrorist. Those are his words, not mine. Those are his, that's his edict, not mine, that went to the FBI. And as a result of that, we as believers today, we're considered domestic terrorists because we stand for truth, because we stand for God, because we stand for the word of God, because we stand in belief by faith that God is able to prevent 
these things from taking place, and so we stand up for truth. The church is under siege today, perhaps as never before. We're called domestic terrorists. We're called uh, those that are uh, renegades, if you will. We're those that are the causing of the problem. I've got an article here that says, School goes ballistic on Christian gal because of her beliefs. The American University, an American university has been sued for punishing a Christian student just because of her Christian beliefs. It is the Alliance Defending Freedom that has brought the case on behalf of a graduate student, uh, Maggie DeJohn, that's D-E-J-O-N, uh, G, uh, against officials of the Southern University, Uni uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, for violating her civil and constitutional rights. In the facts of this, the university, when other students complained about her Christian faith and her expression of their beliefs, ordered her not to have any contact with any other student. Indirect communication, they said, wouldn't even be allowed with those students that were complaining against her. Rather than accept and embrace diverse ideologies and ideological perspectives, the Southern Illinois University officials are determined to force their graduate students to think and to speak exactly the same way or stay silent and not speak anything about your faith. And they will punish anyone who steps out of line, according to the attorney representing Maggie. This article goes on. Maggie has always respectfully shared her religious uh, and political views, which uh, every student is entitled to do under the First Amendment. Further, the article says that Maggie in the school's art therapy uh, program has uh, used social media to express her thoughts, as many students have also done. She also engaged in class discussion on topics including religion, politics, critical race theory, the COVID-19 uh, rules, and much, much more. The school responded with a no-contact order against the student. That came, the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom said, without giving uh, the student the chance to defend herself, without telling her of any allegations against her, and without identifying any policy or rule that she may have violated. That's just one little illustration, and I can read to you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles that validate this permeates the society in which we're living in. And here is Ahab that's saying, pointing his bony finger at Elijah and saying, you're the problem, you're the preacher, you're the one that caused, yes, he's the one that was God's uh, weatherman, he's the one that spoke, spoke for God, he's the one that was obedient to God, but now he's being blamed for what he's done in relationship to pronouncing there'd be no rain for some three, three and a half years. It is a an indication of where we are today and what is taking place in relationship to the animus and the hatred against all all that are Christians, all that are spiritual minded people. We'll see this increase, I believe, in our nation as we face the results of banning God, uh, banning the Bible, ba banning prayer, banning the cross, banning any prayer in public places in the name of Jesus. As the believer stands against abortion today, as the believer stands against the sodomite lifestyle, as the believer stands against the critical race theory that's being taught, as we stand for truth, as we stand against the enemies, we'll be blamed more and more and more for all of the difficulties that take place in our nation. Notice not only the complaint registered, but notice the challenge reminded in verse 19 through 22. 19 through 22 verses. It is the one against 850. That's pretty unusual odds. Isn't it? <laughs> one against 850. It's a challenge. There are two or threefold challenge here. First of all, it's a challenge that's extended to choose. How long halt ye? That means to vacillate to limp between two opinions. Elijah is challenging the people, how long are you going to try to determine whether you're going to serve Baal or God? How long are you going to halt, limp between the, how long as a nation are we going to choose to serve God and honor him or serve government and honor government? How long are we going to be in a position where we're halting between the decision of honoring God in what we do and what we say in our lives? We must choose. Adam and Eve had a choice. Joshua had a choice. The rich young ruler had a choice. We have a choice today. And Elijah is saying to the listening audience of that day, how long are you going to halt between? How long are you going to limp between two opinions? You need to make a choice of what you're going to do and how you're going to respond and what you need to do in that. I'm looking at a little article here that has the words, is your all on the altar? Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart doth the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. 
And the words to that is so apropos in what we need to do in making the choice. We need to make the choice of placing our all on the altar of sacrifice for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe we're in an era today where most, even as Christians, think about me, myself, and I more than thinking about the totality of what we're doing in our life, in our living, in our conversation, in our walk as to what we're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. More Christians today are interested in work and making a profit, work and having a professional uh, climbing the ladder experience than to recognize the need today as never before to choose to please God and to place our lives on the altar of sacrifice. And as the old song says, take my life and let it be only always used for thee is needed today more than ever in the history of our great nation. The challenge is, first of all, to choose. The challenge, secondly, is to be convicted, to have conviction. If the Lord be God, follow him. God wants us to be uh, consecrated, committed, totally sold out to him, sold out and surrendered to serve him. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid would be the question. Elijah is challenging the people to make a choice, challenging the people to have conviction. It takes conviction to stand when everyone else is going the opposite direction. It takes conviction for a person to say, all others may be going this direction, but I believe this is what God would have me to do and to stand here. And I say so often we need to stand for truth even if we stand to death. We need to stand for truth. We need to serve the Lord in gladness of heart in standing for truth. The challenge is, uh, thirdly, not only to choose and to have conviction, but to have courage. Verse 22, I only remain. Now, we discover in further Bible study that he wasn't the only one. But as far as he knew, he was the only one standing because no one else was standing with him. He didn't see any evidence of anyone else standing and doing the battle uh, for godliness and for righteousness and honoring God. He didn't find anybody standing beside him. He was standing alone publicly against 850 false goddesses and gods. And he says, I'm standing alone. God wants believers to have courage and be courageous, willing to stand even if we must stand alone for truth. It's not easy to stand alone. Remember, as Jesus Christ hung on Mount Calvary, he stood alone. He hung on the cross alone. And that is the idea that we have in the text as far as this is concerned is we need to be willing to stand alone even if it means our life is on the limb, if I can use that term, for standing alone. The challenge for courage. I believe it's time that spiritual people, Christians, grow a backbone. I believe it's time pastors grow a backbone. I believe it's time Christians grow a backbone, spiritual backbone that's willing to say, I will stand for God. I will stand for the Word. I will stand for Jesus Christ. I will stand for truth, even if I have to stand alone, even if my life might be in the lurch as a result of it. I'll stand. I'll stand. I'll stand for truth. Not only do we see the complaint registered, and the challenge reminded, but notice the confrontation realized in verse 23 through 29. A fascinating study of these few verses. Elijah confronts the false teachers, the false gods. He confronted those that were teaching error in that day. He stood and against uh, what uh, Dr. J. Vernon McKee called a number of years ago, he was standing against calf worship. <laughs> I can just hear him saying that now. He was standing against idol worship. He was standing against the false worship and the false witness. He was standing against the false gods and the false mindset that permeated society then and even today. He was standing alone as he stood against them. He was standing against, if you put it in the young blood vernacular, for the 21st century, for this era in which we were living. He was standing alone against the critical race theory. He was standing alone against the 1619 lie that's taught in our public schools today. He was standing alone against the push for abortion even after birth. Do you realize it's Washington State, I believe, that just finalized the legislation that a baby can be put to death up to 28 days after it's birthed? 28 days, and the mother can decide. Of course, the law says the mother and her doctor can decide if that baby lives or dies. That is barbaric, that's inhumane, that's ungodly, that's unholy, that is absolutely calling the wrath of God on a nation that turned our backs on God. We need to stand alone and have the courage to stand against what is taking place today with the new age, the new morality, the new movement that takes place today, the new theology that, as I call it, the goosebump theology that's being proclaimed today. We need to stand against it and call truth, truth, and call a lie, a lie. Standing against the drugs and the drinking, 
It's the state of Oregon that one year ago this week passed legislation signed into law that every drug, hard drugs, including, as the little boy says, marijuana, <laughs> heroin, cocaine, marijuana, fentanyl, every drug is legal to be utilized in the state of Oregon. Now they're surprised that overdose deaths have increased by 700%. Not 7%, not 70, 700% increase, and they're concerned about what in the world causes that. Our nation is concerned today, wondering what causes these young men to go ballistic and go out and shoot a lot of people. They're wondering what causes it. In all of the studies that I've done on all of the mass shootings like that, everyone with no exception, every one of them were on some type of psychotropic drug that caused them to do what they were doing, involved also in all kind of pornography online, all kind of murder by way of mass murder with their uh, handheld devices. All of them were absolutely desensitized. And as one said a number of years ago, I just wanted to see what it was like for a real person to die. A real person because he'd already been killing multitudes on his handheld device. I wanted to see what it'd be like for one person, a living person, to die. And yet we're wondering what causes that when we send them to the atheistic infidel schools, our brainwashing and ideological bent that tells the students that we came from a blob in the ocean, that teaches the students that the CRT is correct, that teaches the students that the sodomite lifestyle is okay, that teaches the students that God doesn't exist and we're not obligated to obey God, etc. And we wonder why these things are taking place. We wonder what is happening in our nation. We need to understand here that there's a need to confront the lie that's taking place in society, and only the Christian can do so. As former Senator Jim DeMint said, the Christian, the day o Christian church is the one that has the cust is the custodian for the Bible. We're responsible for what the Word of God says. We're responsible for how it is dispersed and uh, how it is carried out in our nation today. We need to understand that the liberal theology and the PC curriculum that's being taught today, uh, the standards that we have today, the lack of uh, morals and ethics and values, we have a responsibility to do so. Dr. Wilfred Funk, F-U-N-K, said, quote, the most bitter word in the English language is the word alone. 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 Ponder that for a moment. You think that sometimes, you ever thought sometimes that you're the only one standing for truth? That you're the only one standing against the enemy? That somehow, some way, where you work, where your uh, job is, what your profession is, uh, whatever you're doing, that you're the only one that recognizes the line, you're standing for truth, that you're standing alone? Here is Elijah. He's standing alone. As we look at verses 23 through verse 29, we find that he's doing that. The scene has been set. The confrontation is ready. The false teachers are ready. And Elijah has a lot of humor. Notice what he says, verse 27, 28, and 29. And it, I laugh every time I study this text. And it came to pass at noon. Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud. For he is not, he is either, for he is a God. Either he is taking, uh, or either he is ta uh, talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and uh, must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves uh, after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when the midday was passed, and the prophets, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any answer, nor any regard. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Listen to what is taking place. Elijah literally makes fun of the false gods. Elijah makes fun of those that believed in the false gods. Elijah, we see his human, uh, human uh, personality coming out. We see Elijah, can you picture this? Here they are, they're dancing around, they're making all kind of commotions. They even start cutting themselves to try to appease the gods. And they're praying and asking the gods to do something. And Elijah laughs at them and says, perhaps he's busy uh, doing the king's work, talking to the king or doing something. that Perhaps he's pursuing someone. Perhaps he's on a trip. Perhaps he's sleeping. For three hours they're doing that, and Elijah's mocking them. He's making fun of them. Now, Christians have the philosophy today that when it comes to thought of my lifestyle, when it comes to murder by way of abortion, when it comes to all of these ills that's being done, that's brainwashing our kids and putting an ideological bent in their minds that will destroy their hearts and their lives and their future and their eternity, somehow, some way, as Christians say, well, I'm not saying anything about it. You know, after all, we're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to love everybody, and God's going to handle that. 
I've had some folks call on the radio broadcast and say, I don't understand why you're trying to frighten everybody. If we're saved, God's going to handle it. We don't have to do anything. I say, yeah, that's the problem today is silence among those that are Christians it's supposed to be taking a stand. And that's the problem today with uh, not just with Christians in general, but with pastors where there's the mindset, we're going to tell people about Jesus. That's wonderful, isn't it? We're not going to talk about politics. You won't find any place in the Word of God where any Christian, where any God-fearer in the Old Testament, a Christian in the New Testament, refused to take a stand for morals and ethics and values. And that's the problem today. And here is Elijah. He's laughing at, he's mocking, making fun of these false gods and these that are dumb enough, stupid enough, ignorant enough of who the true God is. They're dancing and making all kinds of emotions and cutting themselves trying to appease the Baal gods and the goddesses. I made a little footnote. How comforting to know that our God never slumbers and never sleeps. <laughs> he's closer than our next breath. He always hears our prayers. Not only there must be a commitment to serve actively and the courage to stand alone, but verses 30 through 46, there's the confidence to surrender absolutely. The confidence to surrender absolutely. Notice the charge found in verses 30 through 35. Reading verse 30 again. And Elijah said, And all the people come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar. The altar is torn down. The altar has not been used, keep in mind. The altar has not been used. That's one of the problems. There's not been any spiritual worship. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the stone, sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed that's about uh, five gallons the historians tell us and he put the wood in order that is laid it in order around it and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood uh, and said fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood and verse 34 and 35, and he said, do it the second time. They did it. The second time he said, do it the third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. Here's what he's doing. Elijah is repairing the altar. Notice the charge that is uh, released here. Uh, before he could have the sacrifice, the altar had to be repaired. Broken altar indicates a lack of fellowship, a lack of relationship, a lack of uh, service and surrender to the Lord God. You find in verse 30 and thir 31, 32. So that God's power could be shown even in that. He says, first of all, dig a trench. The ditch would hold about five gallons of water. He says, uh, dig the, uh, uh, not only dig the trench, but he said, uh, the, fill the trenches with wood. Four barrels of water had to go out. The wood there being covered with water, drenching it in water, pouring it so that it's saturated, verse 33, 34, and 35. What Elijah is doing, he's saying, let's make this so difficult, if you will. Let's make this so impossible for anything other than the divine intervention of God that it will show the power of God and will reveal whose God is real really the God of the universe. That's what Elijah's saying. He's saying, he said, if you want to, let's play this game. He wasn't playing a game. I'm putting it that way. Let's play this game. You guys think you have a powerful God? You think that uh, Baal and the Baal priest and priestesses are gods and they have the power to do something? Let's see what God can do. And so he set the stage so that both the uh, uh, sacrifices, the one for the Baal priest and priestesses and the one that is before God, he set the stage so that they would, the word world would see, the onlookers would see, that only God could carry out the task. Notice the confession reviewed in verse 36 and 37. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things, notice, at thy word. He's saying, let the people see that I'm just simply doing what you've told me to do. I'm simply your water boy, if you please. I'm simply your bucket carrier, if you will. I'm simply your messenger. And he said, I want the world to see. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Listen. To what Elijah is doing. Elijah says, 
as he confronts the false teachers, the false gods. He's committed to serve and has courage to stand. But now he comes to the Lord and he confesses, number one, he confesses the ownership of God. He says, God, you own it all. God, you're sovereign. God, you're the one that's in control. God, as I come to you, I've done what you've told me to do. I have done, I carried this out exactly to the letter of your blueprints of what you've said. And he says, not only thou art God in Israel. He says, show the world who's in control. Let the world that's watching know that you're God and that you're in control. I believe that oftentimes we fail to see the power of God because we fail to come back to God and say, God, I'm doing what you said. Now, God, I want you to show the world that I've been obedient to you and that you are going to carry out the task as you've called me to do. It's you, God, that's on the spot now is what Elijah is saying. You, God, it's your reputation that's on the line. God, it's your word that I've been following. He confessed the obedience to God, verse 36, and that I am thy servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. Lord, let the world know that I am obedient to you. Lord, I want you to let the world see that standing here today, that you're God, that you're sovereign, that you're on the throne, and that I'm your servant, that I've been obedient. I believe obedience is necessary if we're going to see the hand of blessing of God in our lives, in our church, in our nation. Obedience for the child of God is absolute in the society in which we're living today. No ifs and ands and buts. Not a matter of saying I'm going to be obedient in this and that and the other, but I'm not going to be obedient here. It takes total, absolute obedience of our all being placed on the altar of sacrifice for the Lord. He says, I want the world to see it. The world today, ladies and gentlemen, is watching watching your life and my life. The world's watching the churches in America and the lost sodomite society, the lost heathen world, the agnostics and the atheists are watching what we do as Christians and as a church. They're watching whether or not we believe and practice what we say that we believe. They're watching to determine whether or not our life is real. They're watching to determine or not whether or not we're fake, phony, and false or whether or not we're true followers of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 38 through 46 as we close. Notice the consequences recognized. Notice what the scripture says in verse 38 and following. Then, then when? I like the little word then. Then, after the altar has been repaired. Then, after the challenge has been made. Then, after the he's challenged the people, why halt you between two opinions? Then, after they had poured the water on the wood. Then, after he says, Lord, I've done what you said, now God, you do what you said. Then, the scripture says, then the fire fell, the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the fire and the stones. Everything around the sacrifice, including the sacrifice, was burned and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. It elicited a belief and faith in God as a result of what Elijah had done. And Elijah said unto them, take the, prophet, <laughs> take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. And so Ahab went to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, that's Mount Carmel, where they had had the sacrifice and where the display had been made. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to, to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and he said, there's nothing. And he said, go, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, look intently and see is what it means. There ariseth a little cloud out of the sea that a man's, uh, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up. Say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass, as in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Listen very carefully as we close. Listen to what the scripture is saying. What it takes when we're committed to the Lord. What does it take when we're committed? Even if we have to stand alone. Courage to stand alone. Confidence to trust and surrender. 
to the Lord. Absolutely. Notice about four or five things. Notice what we see, the power of God is revealed. Then the fire fell. God's power, his fire falls when the committed, uh, courageous, confident man of God carried out what God had called him to do. We'll not have revival in America. We'll not see revival as a church, as a nation, as a city until we do all that God calls us to do and then the fire of God will fall on the nation that's called America. And I believe that it's time that we stand up, speak up, be heard, be seen, even if we have to stand alone as a people if we're going to expect God to perform a miracle in our sight. Not only we see the power of God revealed, but notice the people of God revived, verse 39. Revival surrenders here. As we see revival and surrender and worship, God is honored by the commitment. When our life is committed, it causes others to be committed. When the others saw what God had done as a result of one man standing, as a result of one man's faithfulness, as a result of one man's trusting God, as a result of that, the others around says, we are going to serve God. He's God. He's the one. It brought about a relationship that was not there because the power of God, when the fire of God fell, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They're praising God for the supernatural intervention into the life of their nation if we'll stand for God if we'll be actively involved for him even if we have to stand alone others watching our life will become a witness and a testimony of the power of God and what God would have for us not only the power of God revealed and the people of God revived, but notice the praise to God released, verse 39. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Notice the phony of God removed, verse 40. I like that verse. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let, uh, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. It is obedience to God. It is removing that which is the canker, if you will, in society. As long as the churches in America embrace the sodomite lifestyle, as long as the churches in America embrace the worlds and the customs and the carrying out of what the world does, as long as we inculcate that and bring it in, it's an impossibility to, for the world to see the difference in the church and for them to say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. The phony of God removed. Verse 41 through 46. We see the prophet of God renewed. The prophet of God renewed. You know he's the rain man. <laughs> he's the one that says it's not going to rain until I say so. And now he is expecting God to carry out what he said. God said go and tell Ahab it's going to rain. He carried that out. And now he's sending his servant. Go see if you see any clouds. Servant comes back and says none. Go again, none. Go again, the seventh time. His servant comes back and says, Elijah, if you'd put it in the young blood tonight, I hate to tell you this, but there's a little teeny cloud out there about the size of a man's hand. Elijah didn't say, let's not do anything about it, it's too small. He basically said, Ahab, get your chariot ready, get your umbrella ready, the rain's coming. God said it, that settles it, I believe it, even though the cloud's small, God's at work, God is going to carry it out. Notice it came to pass after the seventh time, verse 44, that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and they and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. In other words, don't let the rain stop you. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jez uh, Jezreel. But notice that 46th verse. Elijah didn't get on a chariot. Notice what the verse says. And the hand of the Lord was with Elijah. In other words, empowering Elijah. And he girded up his loins. He took his robe and pulled it up and put the little belt around it so that his legs would be free to run. And he girded up his loins and ran that supernatural power to run before the enemy. He ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I want us to realize that obedience brings blessings as we serve the Lord. One of the primary things that we find in our nation today is this. This writer says Christians 
have always been some of the most persecuted people in the world, and many have given their lives for Christ. A small price to pay for the reward of eternal life in God's kingdom after having stood firm, even if alone. End quote. May I say to us in these moments, I believe it's time Christians take a stand just as Elijah and believe God. We listen to message after message after message. We study the scripture, read the scripture. We say, whoopee. God's word says that that settles it. We fail to be actively involved, believing and vivifying what we believe is scripturally true. I believe it's time we be activated and place our all on the altar of sacrifice. Then the fire fell, the scripture says. Then after the altar was repaired. Then after the sacrifice was made. Then after obedience to the Lord. Then the fire fell. Stand if you will.